Welcome to the Minnesota Alcohol Use State of the State Webinar 1. My name is Jenny and I'll be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. During the question and answer session, if you have a question, please press star then 1 on your touch tone phone. I will now turn the call over to Lisa Gall. You may begin. Good afternoon in Central <laughs> Standard Time if you're in Minnesota and Wisconsin. This is Lisa Gall from Stratus Health. Um, thank you for joining us today. We are really excited to be able to present this three-part webinar series beginning with a state of the state overview of Minnesota's alcohol use. Um, joining me today in presentation is Mia Croyle, a behavioral health project specialist from our neighboring state, Wisconsin, part of um, the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network um, through Metastar, um, along with Stratus Health, um, Candy Hansen, um, one of our project leads and a project manager at Stratus Health, and my, um, we, her, Candy, and myself, Lisa Gall, um, as a clinical program manager at Stratus Health, um, we work together as part of the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network um, to coordinate um, alcohol use disorders um, through CMS contracts. So um, for this slide, um, because educational credits are being offered for this presentation, we need to inform you the speakers and planners have no conflicts of interest. There are no commercial support um, that has been received for this webinar. Um, for CE credits or a certificate of attendance, you must attend the entire session and complete an online evaluation. We encourage everyone to complete the evaluation to provide feedback on the session. Credits approved for today's webinar are CMEs for physicians, CMEs for nurses, and social work credits from the National Association of Social Workers. We are fortunate today to, at Ellis Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network to work with a number of experts in the field um, from Stratus Health, Metastar, and MPRO. Um, today, one of our Wisconsin experts, Mia Croyle, has agreed to join us to present on a topic we want to bring to the forefront on uh, stigma, and how to address and to communicate with patients in a clinic. Um, we also want to thank Cindy Swan Henderlake and the Minnesota Department of Human Services for co-sponsoring this three-series webinar event along with Lake Superior QIN. Our objectives today are to um, discuss how alcohol use is contributing to Minnesota's 2018 health ranking how to address barriers um, interfering with our ability to address alcohol use, performing alcohol screening as part of routine care as recommended um, by national guidelines through the use of this SBIRT, Screening Brief Intervention, Referral, and Treatment, and um, to interact effectively with patients about alcohol use. So, so what? What about alcohol use? Um, alcohol has really become rather a norm, <clears throat> not only in Minnesota and Wisconsin, but nationwide and worldwide. <clears throat> it's in fact the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. And alcohol-related liver disease has tripled in 25 to 34-year-olds um, from 259 to 767 according to the American Health Rankings. <clears throat> Those rankings are based on what is a standard drink. You know, generally, believe it or not, we have many comments on this simple graphic that outlines what a standard drink is. Many people have become confused by our tendency to exaggerate the sizes in this country and think of that as better. Um, we're supersizing everything nowadays. So when it comes to managing alcohol intake, this is important to consider also. And this includes beers. Um, you know, if you look at a general 12-ounce regular beer, it's about 5% alcohol. And however, you get an 8 to 9-ounce malt liquor um, in the brewery beers, and you're going to get 7% alcohol. So the, the serving size is smaller for the brewery beers that are 7% alcohol, and of course with wines um, are 12% alcohol, and 
your spirits, um, you know, hard liquor, about 40% alcohol. And, and Lisa, this is Candy Hansen, and I'll just interject here. You know, when you when we think about um, our breweries that have opened up, especially in, in the state of Minnesota, um, they're not serving um, brewery beers in an eight or nine ounce fluid um, glass. It's quite a bit larger oftentimes, and so you have to take that into consideration when you're thinking about the alcohol content. The same thing applies for the wine glasses. They're no longer dinner-sized wine glasses. They're mega wine glasses, if you will. Mm -hmm. And unless you're measuring your alcohol content, you really don't know how much you had unless you measure it out or really pay close attention. And if you've had one or two, you know, you may not be measuring them anymore. (laughs) Okay. So next slide um, talks about the short, we all know the short and long-term risks of alcohol misuse. Um, I think the biggest one in here is poor decision-making, which leads to a lot of the things on the left column. You know, obviously, after you've had those, you know, pretty strong drinks, you know, you may um, be more prone to injuries, violence, um, social, legal, and financial issues. And, um, you know, generally, you know, if if you've – we all know that people make poor decisions. It leads to problems both at home and in, in legally. And, of course, long-term alcohol use leads to a whole other set of problems that are more related to our health, alcohol dependence, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, excuse me, liver disease, memory and learning problems, cancers, to name a few. This pyramid represents the general ratio of individuals as determined by the CDC who are at risk. If you look at this um, picture on the right, the drinker's pyramid, uh, you can see the top two red areas. There's only uh, probably less than 4% are risky dependent drinkers, according to the um, uh, determinations of a screening, and um, about 25% who are risky non-dependent drinkers who could benefit from some intervention. Um, so that's the 71%, the remaining fall under moderate and abstaining and really don't um, necessarily need intervention unless your judgment would um, tell you otherwise when you're doing your evaluation of your patients. And most people are unaware um, that there are actually guidelines to distinguish the risk levels for drinking. So. Um, This is out from the SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, and the National Institute on Alcohol, and the CDC. Um, The low-risk alcohol consumption for men um, is is no more than four drinks per day or 14 per week, and for women, no more than three drinks per, per day or seven drinks per week. That, um, if you're, it, according to the guideline and the, um, the screening, that's what considers low risk if you fall in that 71%. For the rest um, who are falling into the risky drinking level, um, binge drinking is one of the risky drinking levels that, um, is, um, that you're not regularly drinking, but if you have five or more drinks in less than two hours, uh, four or more drinks in less than two hours for women, uh, in the past 30 days, that's considered binge drinking. Heavy drinking is binge drinking on five or more days in the past 30 or exceeding the weekly alcohol consumption recommendation. And this is a map of the 2018 um, min- uh, nationwide binge drinking rates. You can see that the upper Midwest generally has some, some pretty high numbers. Over 20% are um, binge drinking, and this has significantly affected our Minnesota health rating in um, 2019. Um, in fact, our binge drinking rate is steadily increasing. Candy, do you have anything to add to that? <clears throat> no. Ex- well, yes. Um, if you look at the, um, uh, the 2018 America Health Ranking site and you look at they have a um, transitional binge drinking map of the U.S. that that goes back as far as 2012. And for Minnesota, if you 
transition through every single year. We have we've been at this rate for a very long time, and it hasn't gotten any better in our state. So, I think that is speaking to why our our health rankings are declining in the in the United or in Minnesota. So that binge drinking is the one that puts people at risk, of course, for those dangerous behaviors and injuries and deaths related to them. So what makes it so hard to discuss alcohol use when, you know, patients come into the clinic? One of the biggest reasons is that alcohol has become such a part of our culture and a norm um, across, not only here, but across the world. Um, the alcohol um, um, targets specific groups. I'm sorry, I'm one of the most effective ways um, for alcohol uh, manufacturers is to target specific groups. And as you see on this slide here, it's pretty small, but the left um, part that is circled, it shows the um, disparities between uh, the number of likes on Facebook for alcohol brand marketing versus the number of likes for health promotion and prevention of alcohol use marketing on Facebook, and just the sheer numbers here tell you a lot. You know, you get hundreds and two hundreds of thousands of likes on um, the, from the manufacturers and thousands, if that, on um, hundreds on the health promotion side. I just thought it was an interesting compare, and as, as I look at Facebook occasionally, I'm not on there a lot, but almost, almost every time there's an alcohol ad on Facebook. And we can say the same about all of our supermarkets and wherever we go, billboards, et cetera. We're just pounded with, you know, alcohol um, use um, temptations, if you will, and uh, suggestions that this is how we're supposed to deal with life stressors is to use alcohol. And, of course, there are other factors affecting our ability to effectively address these issues, and um, I'm going to allow Mia Croyle from Wisconsin to give a brief introduction of herself and her background, and then um, discuss those other barriers. Mia? Thank you, Lisa. Um, as she said, I'm Mia Croyle, and I am a Behavioral Health Project Specialist at MetaStar in Wisconsin. I um, come to this work with about 10 years experience. Um, in integrated care situations where I was um, either directly in the clinic um, facilitating the process to screen patients for alcohol um, misuse, drug misuse, um, and also mental health concerns. Um, so screening them, delivering some brief interventions, and then um, following that I've been involved in some um, training programs and things like that to just really try and promote this practice and help uh, better equip uh, primary care settings to address alcohol use with their patient population. One of the big, um, as Lisa's been talking about, one of the big barriers to effectively incorporating this in our primary care um, routines, it really is stigma. And stigma is defined as this negative perception that can be assigned to a person because of something that that is happening with them, something can be something innate that they're born with or something they're doing. And so we see with patients there's a huge deal of stigma associated with alcohol use. Uh, let's see. I am just trying to figure out how to advance to the next slide. <laughs> That's not it. Hi, Mia. If you click into um, – um, there you go. Got it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, no so when we talk about stigma, we there's externalized stigma. And so that stigma that we may um, – or one individual sort of puts on another person. It impacts the way we view them. Um, so we label other people as different or inferior, um, and that can really um, impact our ability to see 
patients who may be struggling with alcohol use as, as people that we need to provide care for. Um, so if we ask you to picture someone who is having a problem with alcohol use or misusing alcohol, I'm going to invite everyone to just sort of conjure up a picture in their mind of what that person might look like. This slide um, shows a picture of one common thing that comes to mind, you know, someone who is male, um, not necessarily making good choices, they're, you know, sitting on the side of the road, not um, engaged actively and productively in their life. Um, and uh, so that's our often our common, you know, we think about there's the sort of classic image of um, a person with an alcohol problem sleeping under a newspaper on a park bench, right? Um, when in reality we know that the vast majority of people who uh, struggle with, uh, with problematic alcohol use look more like these individuals, right? They uh, dress like you and I may dress every day. They are often employed. Um, and go to, you know, working, having activities throughout their day, really looking indistinguishable from uh, you or I or any other patient who may come into your clinic. Another aspect of our stigma is this internalized stigma um, where we think about this is the person um, taking those negative messages that other people may have when they view them and sort of turning them inward. And this is often associated with a great deal of shame and anxiety around their situation. And this can be what makes it hard for patients to ask for help. This can be what makes it hard for patients to say, hey, you know, Doc, I, I'm really wondering uh, it seems like something's going on and I'm drinking more and more. Can we talk about that a little bit? Um, those conversations rarely happen, and one factor around that is that internalized stigma or, or bias. Lisa, you were going to talk a little bit about the um, this Minnesota-specific data around who actually is binge drinking and what does that person look like. So thank you, Mia. And so as that picture came up with the, the gentleman on the side of the street, you know, really in reality, um, what I have circled here is we had Candy and I pulled a lot of statistics along with Cindy um, from the Minnesota Department of um, Human Services, and um, this American Health Ranking file had these all together. But really, you look at, in Minnesota at least, um, the things that are circled in red is that generally males are a little higher, but, you know, females are, you know, closely behind. Um, also in the age group of the 18 to 44, um, Minnesota, uh, lead, you know, is ahead of the U.S. in um, our statistics of heavy drinking or binge drinking, um, but also we're ahead of the U.S. in all other ages as well. And in urban or versus rural, um, this has been a, a kind of a misnomer uh, is that people are thinking that this is more of a rural issue. It, it truly is all over the place, and Minnesota, again, exceeds the U.S. in all areas here, um, especially in suburban um, areas. And income levels, you know, generally, again, we, we try to, we generally associate um, low income with alcohol, but it's actually not the case in that, um, yes, Minnesota exceeds in all areas of income um, classes, but there's actually more binge drinking in the higher income classes. And then I'm going to turn this back on over to Mia. Sure, thank you. And nationwide, if we look at statistics like these across racial and ethnic categories, we see that there really isn't um, a ton of variance. Um, as well as, you know, educational levels. So um, our perception that typically someone who is drinking more than they should is, 
you know, um, that they are young, male, maybe living in the city, um, not white, uh, not wealthy, not well-educated. That, that perception really does not hold true. Um, so our stigma can really translate into um, actual discrimination when that stigma gets codified and, you know, translates and becomes part of our systems. When it happens, when it starts to get woven into the system, system level issues, um, it really can start to look a little like discrimination against people with problems around alcohol use. And we see this um, in, in our culture and our attitudes. Um, we see this in the fact that our um, medical staff tend to be less well prepared to address alcohol use than they are in, to address lots of other conditions that are much more rare and they're much less likely to encounter in the primary care setting. We see this in workflows that aren't designed to address um, and even aren't, a, aren't designed to capture or screen for alcohol use uh, problems. We see this in payment and billing rates that are for addressing these issues that are well below those for lots of other conditions. And we see this in, um, you know, the troubles and the um, complicated coding situation for addressing these. We also see this um, when individuals uh, seek out um, specialty care and are met with high deductibles or other, other um, barriers to accessing care. So what's the remedy for all of this? We're not going to change the culture overnight, but what can we do in our healthcare context? Um, and the main thing is we can treat alcohol misuse like any other chronic condition. So we have research-based guidelines for lots of things in healthcare. We give lots of um, guidelines for lots of things. There's recommendations for how many fruits and vegetables you should get, um, recommendations on how much dairy or calcium we should consume. We make recommendations about sunscreen, seat belts, helmet use, lots of things in a sort of health-based prevention mindset that we're making recommendations for. And we, likewise, we have our research-based low-risk drinking guidelines as well. So Lisa's already alluded to these, but for men, it's no more than four drinks on any given day and no more than 14 drinks total per week. And for women, it's no more than three drinks on any given day, no more than seven drinks per week. Now, these are for healthy, non-pregnant adults, and it's also important to remember these are not the safe driving limits. Um, these are just the limits that research has found. If you stay at or below these levels, you are at the lowest possible risk for negative outcomes associated with alcohol use. And one of the things that I frequently encounter in primary care practices when I'm encouraging them to start talking with their patients about these limits is some hesitancy to bring that up because um, I hear things in Wisconsin, and I, I imagine it's a little similar in Minnesota. I hear things like, well, I don't even drink within these guidelines. I don't know anyone who does. Um, and so when I encounter things like that, I often um, refer them back to lots of the other guidelines that we're sharing with patients. And I ask them, you know, are you always meeting all of these requirements? And often people will easily say, no, no, I know them, and, you know, I manage my way around them as I see fit. And in reality, that's what we hope that people will do with these guidelines. We're not going to present them in a punitive way or, oh, my gosh, you're going to die if you drink more than this or anything like that. It's just these are guidelines. I, um, I've heard them uh, likened to a speed limit. When you get on a highway, if you don't know the speed limit, you can um, you have some choices about how to manage your speed. Generally, if there are cars around you, you can kind of try to go about the same speed as the cars around you and figure you're safe. Uh, 
Um, if there's no cards around you and you're figuring it out kind of on your own, you just make your best guess based on the information you have available at the time, and you drive, you know, a certain speed. When you encounter a speed limit sign, then you have more information, and you're able to make some choices. I certainly don't always drive within that recommended <coughs> speed, but I, I have the, all the information at hand, and I can make some choices. Do I want to drive over that speed limit? What risks am I taking when I make that choice? And I'm aware of those risks, so I'm, I'm an informed driver at that point. And this is what we hope for our patients, is that they can have and understand this information so that they can navigate their own choices as they see fit. So expert is a process that has been proposed and promoted um, in general healthcare settings for helping patients sort of navigate that and making sure that we're doing our part as a healthcare organization in helping make sure that the right patients get the right information at the right time. So the S is for screening, B is for brief intervention, the BI is for brief intervention, and the RT is for referral to treatment. So a couple of things about if you were to want to implement a screening process, there are lots of different, there are several different screens out there that are approved. And we could certainly um, give you some guidance on, you know, selecting a screen that fits for you, but usually that's a larger organizational or system level decision. Um, but what we do want to make sure happens is that we um, normalize that process for people. One of the big concerns often is, oh my goodness, if I'm going to start handing people a questionnaire that asks them about their alcohol use. Is that just going to make my patients uncomfortable? Are they going to get angry? What's going to happen? So we recommend that when possible, if you can embed this into other question, into a questionnaire that asks about other areas of their health as well. Um, typically, we um, see it embedded in a questionnaire that might ask about depression as well, smoking use, um, diet and exercise, um, domestic violence. The important thing is that whatever you screen for, you have to make sure you're prepared to provide some intervention for. Um, so don't screen for stuff you're not ready to address. But, you know, embedding, <coughs> excuse me, embedding our alcohol questions in with those other things can help normalize it. Because we just want to send the message that this is a part of routine care. This is part of our clinical prevention services. Um, and some messaging that we've used when the questionnaire is handed out is something similar to we're asking all of our patients to fill out this questionnaire. Some of the questions might seem like they don't apply to you. Just answer them the best they, that you can. Um, and the hyperlink in that slide actually goes to a video example that can show um, various ways to distribute a questionnaire like that and collect it. There will be patients who decline to complete the questionnaire, um, and we want to we want to recognize that if if they do, it's important to respect their choice, um, and that there are many reasons that a patient may decline. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have a problem with alcohol. Um, they may decline because um, you know they're not feeling well that day. They're in a hurry. They have had negative experiences in the past with having these conversations in a healthcare context. There may be, you know, this may be a very sensitive topic for them because of family history. Um, there's lots of reasons why a patient may decline. Ultimately, the provider can determine what, if any, further action is needed. They may want to just have a conversation with them rather than having them complete the questionnaire, et cetera. And we do recommend when someone is um, when you're just first introducing a screening program, that we track which, which patients decline, and that can help us with our quality improvement processes because one of the things I've known that we've noticed in clinics in the past is that, you know, maybe there's one um, receptionist or medical assistant who's very uncomfortable handing it out, and they have a much higher percentage of patients declining 
than the rest, and so that can help us target our, our education with that individual. Or maybe it's that we find out that, um, you know, a certain time of day tends to get more declines, and is there something we can do to address that? Um, or a certain group of patients, maybe patients who schedule a same-day appointment, um, and they're coming in because they're acutely ill, maybe those patients tend to decline more. So we can look for trends if we track that. And um, also then in here, there's a hyperlink, and I noticed it's those hyperlinks, thank you, have been put in the chat box as well. Um, but there is um, a little example that just shows the clinical scenario of when a patient declines and various ways to uh, navigate that. So when a patient does uh, fill out their, their, um, their screening, and they're determined to be in need of some form of brief intervention, we want to provide that in the context of the primary care office. Now, a lot of times people feel like, hey, my only job at that point is to refer them to somebody else. But what we know is that we can do a lot of good and we can really impact um, the, the use pattern of those people who are in that binge drinking category or that at risk or risky use category. And those individuals probably wouldn't even meet the criteria for um, specialty care or getting AODA services per se, but we can help them reduce their drinking, which overall will have a great impact individually and on a population health level. So when we're doing that intervention, we want to, we have the goals of activating their motivation helping them think about drinking less or stopping drinking, depending on where they're at with their use pattern currently. We might think about helping them access another resource, such as treatment or in a further assessment or a mutual help or self-help group, um, such as AA. And we also want to be thinking always about planting seeds for the future. So not just in this conversation, but the idea is that in primary care, we're having a longitudinal relationship with these patients. We're going to see them back again. So we want to start planting these seeds. We may not harvest those seeds for many, many visits down the line, but thinking about planting those seeds now in our intervention as a result of what we find out in the screening. So we know from the research that um, brief interventions that just provide education or um, information are not as effective as those that incorporate motivational interviewing. Um, so simple advice is good. Simple advice with motivational interviewing, a little bit of that can go a long way. Um, and we also know that follow-up contact can also um, increase the effectiveness of one of those brief interventions delivered in primary care. There are a variety of different um, sort of models for providing brief intervention. Um, I like the flow model because it's short and sweet and easy to remember. So just like flow from, what is that, progressive health insurance, um, we're going to provide, we're just going to do a little quick intervention with flow here. So we're going to provide feedback, we're going to listen and understand, and we're going to explore options. What we're not going to do is warn the patient or try to scare them into changing in some way. We're also not going to try too hard to persuade them because we know that when, when we take a heavily persuasive stance, that just invites pushback. Uh, from the patient's point of view, and we don't want to get our patients feeling defensive about their use in any way. <clears throat> so what those steps would look like is we'll be setting the stage, sharing the feedback and the recommendation, exploring the current situation, drawing out some change talk or some arguments for change from the other person, which is very different than providing it for them. We're drawing it out, evoking it from them, and then exploring options, talk about potential options and scheduling some follow-up or setting up some follow-up. So what might that feedback look like? Initially, we're going to ask their permission. Hey, you completed a screen at the beginning of your visit today that asked you a bunch of questions about alcohol and some other things. Would it be okay if we talked about that a little bit right now? 
and we're going to offer the feedback. And that's going to look like, um, you know, based on the way you answered that screen, it sounds like your drinking is falling into what we would call a risky use or at-risk category. What that means is that um, you're drinking above the low-risk guidelines. And um, when you do that, you put yourself at additional risk for negative stuff associated with your alcohol use. What do you think about that? So we ask permission. We offer the feedback in patient-friendly, easy-to-understand, non-labeling or judgmental language. And we ask for their response. We want to hear their response, try to listen and understand, stick with them and not, you know, if they say, oh, that can't be right, we don't start arguing with them about why it's right. We just kind of hang in there with them about it. That's surprising for you. Um, and let them have their response. And then we might uh, say, you know, after they've talked about their response to the feedback a little bit, say, hey, if it's okay, I'd like to share a recommendation based on where you're at. Um, assuming they say yes, which most people do, we would say, um, based on, you know, what we know, the safest and healthiest option for you would be to um, work to drink a little bit less so that you're within those low-risk guidelines, which, you know, for a male your age are no more than four drinks per occasion, no more than a total of 14 drinks a week. What are your thoughts on that? Again, we're going to listen to their response um, and uh, see what see what we hear, and then respond to it appropriately. <clears throat> so, in that person in that personalized feedback, we're going to compare it to that. Um, we might also think about comparing their use to national or state norms. Yeah, to sort of have some data at your fingertips and be pretty well versed in the data to be able to do that. We can also think about what chronic health conditions does that individual have and what impact might their alcohol use be having on that. Think about what medications they're currently having and what impact um, the alcohol use might be having on that. And then think about what we know about the overall life goals and values of this patient and how might alcohol be helping or getting in the way of those. We're going to listen to understand. In order to do that, we're going to ask them some open questions. You know, how do alcohol or drugs fit into your day-to-day -day life? What might be some of the downsides of drinking for you? If you were to decide to make a change, how might your life be different? If you were to decide to make a change, how might you go about that? All of these questions are specifically designed to get at what we call in motivational interviewing is change talk. The simple way of saying that is it's just the other person's arguments for change. So we want to hear from their point of view in their own words, why does this change, why might this change be important to them? And then we're going to try to use a little reflective listening, which is one of our motivational interviewing skills, um, <laughs> with a goal to understand their perspective. So we try to grasp their meaning and then offer that back to them as a reflective listening statement. And then we might transition after we've heard from them and had a little bit of discussion. I wonder what you're thinking at this point. Where does all this leave you? What would be most helpful for us to do now? Some version of one of those questions would be a nice transition. And then let the other person take the lead on what comes next. Some potential options would be to, you know, stick within the lower guidelines. Patients who are non-dependent and not experiencing a whole lot of harm from their, from their alcohol use are usually able to modify their drinking patterns fairly easily. Um, so just them just saying, gosh, now that I know that there are these low-risk guidelines, <clears throat> I'll keep those in mind next time I'm out drinking. That may be enough effort for them. And then what we would want to do is follow up and see did they actually do that or not. We want to express support and encouragement for any reduction, even if they say, yeah, those drinking guidelines sound really low. I'm currently drinking like, you know, a six-pack a day every day, so there's no way I'm going to get to that 14, but I could say I'll go down from six, six a day to five a day. 
right? That's still positive movement, and we want to encourage that. <clears throat> we might share some resources for them. One really nice one is linked in here, this Rethinking Drinking document. It's designed to be patient-facing, and it talks them through both reasons and strategies for making changes to their alcohol use. It reinforces some of the messaging that we've talked about already today. And then depending on the severity and also depending on other complicating factors, so if they have a lot of other mental health stuff going on, a lot of other things going on in their life right now that are, that are chaotic or traumatic, you may want to consider a referral. And you may schedule a follow-up appointment or just a quick check-in call with them. So we are at time. I spoke a little, or we're at the end of my prepared information. I spoke a little quicker than I thought I would. So um, if you have questions, I think we're going to open it up for Q&A, but I will let Lisa um, manage that part. So this is Candy, um, and I just have a couple of follow-up questions for both of you um, and, and a couple of comments. Um, the Rethinking Drinking um, website, I love that website. Um, it is, you have the option of either ordering um, written materials so that you could order them for free for your clinics um, just to be able to give out as a resource. And they also have an interactive um, assessment sort of question tool, if you will. Um, so it asks just a couple of questions about your drinking, and then it says, here's where you fall in the guidelines, and then it says, and if you're looking for some resources about how you might want to think about cutting down drinking, there's a um, there's like a diary, if you will, about keeping track of your daily drinking and some other things in there. So I just want to really put out a shout out for that website because I love it. And I think it's a really good website. Um, so, uh, and, oh, and just one other comment, Mia, that I would say um, when you're doing using motivational interviewing techniques, I always like the um, the confidence level question. So if if a, if a patient says, "Well, I think I might be able to try this," I like to ask, um, you know, on a scale of one to ten, what's your confidence that you're going to be able to do that then? Um, because it gives you as a as a, a clinician sort of an indication about if that's like too big of a goal for them based on what they're they know or if they need to maybe step back step that back a little bit. Um, so Lisa, my my question my first question is for you. Um, <clears throat> what um, why are, you know the guidelines for women's drinking no more than three a day or seven a week? Why are they so much less for women than they are for men? Well, I, I believe that's just more of a, a physio physiological thing. Women have a little more um, less lean body mass, if yep. you will, and um, men are bigger in general, and so it's probably body size. I mean, you stand next to a guy, and generally the guy is usually larger than me. Yep. And the other thing that I've heard is that, uh, I, I, and I wasn't, I didn't mean to put that in the spot, Lisa, but the other thing, too, is our water um the amount of water that we have in our bodies as well, right? Oh, of course. It, yeah. Not only the amount of water, the amount of food and right. you know, right. all of that, you know, will certainly. And, you know, I'm sure there are other factors in there. I couldn't tick them off one by one. But yep. water, food, of course, we, we know that. And how much impact our water composition in general as women versus men. Oh, oh I see. The difference yeah. in physiologically. Yep, yes. yep. Yes. And then my next question is for both of you. So we hear the argument. We have heard the argument. We certainly know in Minnesota that our uh, resources are scarce in terms of, and especially when you get out into rural Minnesota, in terms of where you would actually um, be able to refer someone to um, who indicated that, that, that they needed a more intensive level of intervention. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could address the question, what would you say then about the argument that um, we just couldn't possibly, we don't want to open up that can of worms, we don't want to ask that question um, because we don't have the resources to refer anyone to that uh, locally. So why, you know, so basically why would you ask the question? So um, Mia, do you want to tackle that one first and I'll follow up? 
Sure thing. Um, so um, I would say that's even more of a reason why you should in primary care um, be screening and providing some brief intervention. Um, knowing that there aren't other resources out there in your community is a strong and compelling argument to intervene upstream as much as possible. So what we're hoping to do with Expert is, you know, number one, help those individuals who are drinking in that risky category, those are binge drinkers and those who drink above the low risk guidelines, but aren't yet experiencing all the harms that we associate from alcohol. So we want to um, get them to change their drinking pattern before they start to experience harms or before they develop dependence. So if we're able to do that um, effectively in primary care, we can change the trajectory of um, the influx of patients needing that specialty care. Secondly, there are additional things that a practice could do. Um, in addition to brief interventions, they could look to telehealth resources. They could also look to um, having their providers prescribe some of the pharmacotherapies that exist for helping patients who are likely dependent on alcohol manage that. Um, there are some effective pharmacotherapies out there. Um, and so depending on, you know, you're, you're not going to necessarily be billing it as alcohol and other drug treatment or IOTA treatment, but those patients can and have successfully been managed in primary care. And so if we think about what has happened with depression care, now a lot of patients with fairly, you know, run-of-the-mill depression are managed completely in primary care and they never get to see a psychiatrist. We know psychiatry resources are few and far between, and so we really reserve those specialists for the most complex cases. And wouldn't it be great if we could get to a situation in both our rural and our urban settings where we're using those specialty resources um, for the most complex cases, and we have some capacity in primary care to address a large percentage of the patients who, quite frankly, aren't that complex. That's a great response, Mia. Thank you for that. And, and this is Lisa. I'll just add into that a little. Um, thank you. That was a very good response. And um, I think the other tendency for clinicians, at least in, in my own experience, I worked worked in primary care and ER as a family nurse practitioner. And um, and, and I hear this when we're um, coaching clinic coordinators and quality um, people is that, you know, our staff is just laughing at these questions, you know, and so they're laughing it off. And if, you're, if your patients see that the staff or the clinicians are laughing about it, they're going to feel like it's kind of a joke. So we really, really need to work hard with our staff to make this a serious um, guideline um, educational opportunity for our patients. Um, and I think it is starting to, to turn a little bit. And even in rural areas, I was I live in a rural area, and last week I was at a grocery store, and I heard somebody in front of me saying, my doctor told me today that I should probably cut down on my drinking. Oh. And I thought that was a really good thing. He, and he, he asked, he said, I then um, asked my doctor how much he drank, and I think I need to get a new doctor who drinks more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just thought it was rather comical, but it was a, it, it's kind of the reality. People kind of laugh it off, and we have to really take this seriously as a guideline only and choices that we can make. I didn't even know that I, you know, I, you know, occasionally drink above the weekly limit, you know, and, you know, it, it makes me think about the number of drinks. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that's, uh, that's just when, you know, when you speak to the culture, and the workflow, you really do need to take the time to make sure that everybody who touches this um, understands what the guidelines are and what you're trying to accomplish and really understands that you, uh, if you're trying to change your culture from uh, treating alcohol like an acute episodic condition versus a chronic um, long, you know, a chronic condition, that that really does take ongoing education for everybody to understand, number one, and, and as you mentioned, Lisa, 
if somebody's laugh, you know, if, if someone's laughing themselves at it, what's that about? You know, is that about their their own discomfort asking, or is that about their own use, or you know, what's that about? Um, and kind of try to get to that, so that you can have a culture where everybody consistently does what you're hoping to do, and and does so um, in a way that's consistent for everyone. So if you have any questions, um, we have a few minutes left. Please feel free to. Um, so we should maybe op have the operator open up the line. Yeah, Anna. Thank you. If you have a question, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. There will be a delay before the first question is announced. If you're okay. using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then one on your touchtone phone. And also, put you're free to put anything in the chat as well. And and um, Mia, will you pass the ball back to us? There's uh, we, oh, she did already. Okay, so maybe Jenna, while we're waiting for the um, first question. Um, so if you go to the um, Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network website and you go to behavioral health, what we've done here, and can you just scroll just a little bit? We um, we have posted resources that you're that you can both as a clinician use as well as patient resources, both based on depression screening and alcohol screening. And so you can see some other things along the right side like motivational interviewing resources, um, process improvement things, the expert overview, um, so the manual on how to implement expert into your um, <clears throat> into your organization. Um, and then just a bunch of, in, like, why we screen, for example, um, just some things that you could use in your clinic to put up in your clinic um, or to, to be able to provide um, education resources to people. And, of course, included with this, this is Lisa at Stratus Health, is the uh, depression um, resources as well because we had a dual um, uh, program funding with depression and alcohol use. However, they seem to really go hand in hand. And generally, somebody with an alcohol use disorder may have some depression issues or other mental health issues. And we were really encouraging you to do a, a multi-purpose screening. However, at our next webinar, we will go into a little more deep dive on the um, use of um, the expert and the screening tools for alcohol use disorder. Mm -hmm. And that um, next webinar will be on May 14th, same time. And the final webinar on May 30th, 29th, uh, 29th sorry, May 29th, will will address more on, you know, how to handle um, the the more um, intense, intense interventions, interventions sure. and referrals and treatments. However, next webinar we will have the um, demonstration by Cindy Swan Henderlight from Minnesota Department of Human Services on the Minnesota Fast Tracker. And so we'll have some pretty um, in-depth um, issues coming up with our next webinars. And we're waiting for any questions if anyone is in the queue. Thanks, Jenna. We have no questions over the phone. Okay. We'll just wait. A, just and we're going to just now yeah, we'll hold give it a little silence here. Wait. So you can also chat if, you, if you're not comfortable. Um, talking, go ahead and put any questions in, anything you'd like us to review. And also, we do have an evaluation that we would like you to complete at the completion of this webinar so that you can get your um, CEUs, CEUs, DNEs. <clears throat> yep. And that evaluation will pop up when you um, go close out of the webinar, so we really encourage everyone to fill that out for us. Um, so we can know if there's anything we need to do to improve uh, in the next two webinars that and, we'll be putting out. And, of course, if you have any questions after you drop off the webinar, feel free to shoot us an email, um, give us a call, or um, get a hold of us at Stratus Health. Um, also, the Minnesota Department of Health is doing some very similar initiatives around alcohol use. You know, we hear a lot about opioid use, um, but we just don't hear a lot about alcohol use, and it's the elephant in the room. We really need to, to look at our um, use of alcohol and overuse. And Mia um, just posted the uh, resource for uh, rethinking drinking. Um, and, you know, basically I just type in rethinking drinking and it pops up. So 
We'll give this a few more minutes, or a few more seconds, minutes. <laughs> Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us on the first of the three webinar series. Uh, it does not appear that there are any further questions at this point, and we're going to um, wrap this up just a little early and give you a couple minutes back to your day, and thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Mia. We really appreciate your input. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.